Good evening and welcome to NASA headquarters. Uh, this year we're celebrating the 2019 International Astronautical Congress right here in Washington, D.C. We're very excited to have our audience here. This evening we've got a great show in store for you. We're going to first talk to some young professionals, then some se uh, senior leadership uh, here at NASA, and also astronauts like myself. And uh, we're going to discuss our roles at NASA and how we're charging out into the future on this new adventure of Artemis. My name is NASA astronaut Doug Wheelock. Uh, everyone at NASA calls me Wheels. You can call me Wheels or Papa Wheels. The astronauts on, on board the station now call me. And um, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm joined by some panelists of young, uh, young professionals that have joined us here at NASA. And so we're going to dive right in. I've got some questions for my panelists. So uh, Farah, why don't you tell us about your journey uh, to getting here to NASA? Yeah, so my journey to NASA started through the internship program. I actually interned at the Jet Propulsion Lab out in LA back in 2012, and that was the summer that we landed the Curiosity rover on Mars. So I was there as a bright-eyed engineer seeing this massive rover landing on Mars, and sort of when I fell in love with the NASA family, and I could not not join the team that made these incredible things happen. Um, so I'm now an engineer on the Mars 2020 rover on the mobility system, making sure that the rover will be able to self-drive on Mars. So it's kind of come full circle. Wonderful. Um, I'm Alexis Vance. I am a chemical engineering student right now at Oklahoma State University. And I started my NASA journey just as a freshman in college. I got involved through the Office of STEM Engagement and participated in a couple activities there, which helped me land my internship now as a Pathways intern at the Johnson Space Center, where I work in flight operations, specifically ensuring our space station has power. Buenas tardes. Me llamo Victor. Joel Cabezas Tapia. My name is Victor Joel Cabezas Tapia. I'm a mechanical engineer. I got my mechanical engineering degree from um, the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and I also got my electrical engineering degree from there as well with a concentration in controls. I'm really excited in January, I'm gonna start my PhD in mechanical engineering with a co uh, concentration in dynamics and control. And uh, I work for Marshall Space Flight Center and where I do navigation guidance and control work. And uh, so wh where do I fit in the NASA, uh, in, in the Artemis mission? So we put the uh, flight control systems inside the vehicle and that makes the decisions that, that we do on a day to day, uh, for, for the, to, for, to move the vehicle where it needs to go, so. Um, I'm Brianne Stickler. Um, I started my bachelor's degree at the University of Central Florida, getting my degree in aerospace engineering. And in my second year there, I was in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and that's what, and through that we actually got to go and tour the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and that was the first time I actually got the chance to go out and actually see one of the space centers, and that got me really excited to you know go out and work, hopefully with NASA, and it got me really excited to try to pursue that journey. And then. Um, a few years later, I worked as an intern with a contracting company called Jacobs, and through there, I got to go and kind of work on within their asset management and their operations and maintenance, and I got to actually see and work with a couple of the engineers for the crawler transporter, and through that internship and meeting those people and those other engineers and kind of getting my foot in the door that way, that's how I got hired on full-time as an operations engineer for the crawler transporters and structures group. Thank you very much. You can, as you can see, we come from diverse backgrounds as we work here at NASA together. Um, this year, of course, 2019, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first people walking on the moon. It was a great celebration, and uh, that was our Apollo missions. And of course, Apollo was the god of the moon, and he had a twin sister, Artemis. And Artemis is the goddess of the moon. Our next great adventure uh, at NASA is our Art Artemis missions where in 2024, we'll have the first woman and the next man set foot on the surface of the moon. We're very excited about that. And um, with, our diver with our diverse backgrounds, I wanted to ask our panelists, um, like uh, Farah, in your, in your background, what obstacles have you uh, had to overcome in your journey to get here to NASA? Yeah, my journey here definitely wasn't sort of a, a straight path or a highway to NASA. I grew up in Canada in um, a town outside of Montreal, it's very small. Um, and for me, working at NASA was kind of the stuff of movies, right? I saw Apollo 13, and um, but I somehow decided one day that that's what I wanted to do. And everyone thought I was a little crazy um, because I didn't know anyone who worked at NASA growing up. And I even, even was told by career advisors in high school that 
well, engineering is really for men, you're a woman, are you really gonna be able to deal with this male-dominated field? Um, and I sort of decided to pursue it despite sort of the discouragement and got, just told myself I'll just keep trying and eventually made it through the doors. Right? And, and what I've learned as part of that journey is that there is really a place for everyone at NASA um, and it's becoming you know, more and more that way also. So. Awesome. Just recently, you may remember, about a week and a half ago, we celebrated the first unmanned spacewalk, right? We had two women that were outside in a spacewalk. And Alexis, you worked on those recent spacewalks. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey here at NASA? So how I started my NASA journey was originally in high school, my freshman year, I got involved in an organization at my university called the Space Cowboys. And what that organization does is several of the programs that the Office of STEM Engagement does, they release challenges and they ask college students to solve those challenges. One of the programs I worked with was called MicroG Next, where they ask college students to design tools that we would hopefully use on a spacewalk or an EVA. And those tools, after we design and build them and they have to be approved by NASA engineers, we get to test them in the neutral buoyancy lab, which is a giant pool that we have at NASA that we use to simulate a microgravity environment and train astronauts. And so through that process, I made a lot of connections at the Johnson Space Center as well as a lot of mentors. And that helped me, not only inspire me to go work there, but helped me find a position there. Awesome, thank you, Alexis. For Victor, Tell us a little bit about your background, what brought you to NASA, and some of the challenges you face and the, uh, the things you're working on that inspire you to come to work each day. So a little bit about my background. I'm a first generation uh, naturalized American in the United States. So uh, one thing that I want to share with everybody that there's, there's an opportunity for everyone. There's international partnerships and you too can become a rocket scientist. But a little bit of what inspires me to, uh, to go to work every day. I'm, I'm a nerd when it comes to being able to take any type of system, whether it be mechanical, electrical, for example, let's take your car, being able to derive an ordinary differential equation from it, and then taking that equation and then controlling it, dri driving a control law. And, uh, and then there's, there's programming aspects to it, but ultimately, like, I'm the type of guy that jumps out of bed every morning to be able to solve those problems. So that's what inspires me to get, go to work today. And being able to understand those problems, I can better, better teach the, the, the next generation, the, the Artemis generation, of how to solve those problems more efficiently. Thank you, Victor, appreciate that. Brian, you're 22. I think you're the youngest person ever to operate the crawler. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how that's inspired you about the Artemis prog program? Yeah, so um, not only do we get to drive it, which is you know incredible on its own, but we also are in charge of like maintaining it and, do, and performing and making sure that it's up to spec and that it's ready to go whenever you know we need to transport something. So. That's really exciting too, is to be able to go and like learn all the systems and learn all of the structures nearby that um, we get to maintain and work on and operate when we do have flight hardware. And so that's something else that I'm really excited for is once we actually get the flight hardware and you know everyone can see the culmination of their hard work and see it stacked on the mobile launcher and then going and drive and driving underneath it, picking up, and then being able to actually be a part of the team that drives it to the, mo the launch pad and see it launch and just see the culmination of everyone's hard work. It's going to be really exciting. That's really amazing. That, I don't know if you've ever seen that crawler down there, but that's quite amazing. Thank you for that. I think we're going to go to social media. If you're out there on social media listening in, uh, use the hashtag AskNASA and send your questions to us. I think we'll take a, a question from social media. We have one question from social media. This question is actually for Brienne. Brienne, how much does the human crawler weigh and can you stop it in case of an emergency? Yeah, so the crawler itself weighs about six million pounds um, and then it's rated after the upgrades that have been made in the past couple years, it's now rated to carry um, 18 million pounds to carry SLS and the mobile launcher. Um, and there's a couple ways to stop it if it's not uh, an extreme emergency. If you just want to check something out, um, it's you control the speed by a potentiometer, and so you can just dial the speed back, and it'll stop within a couple of minutes. If it is an emergency, um, there's an e-stop that will shut off all the power, and the crawler will just continue to roll to a stop. Um, and if it's a, an extreme emergency that you have to stop like right this second, you hit the e-stop, and then there's also some brakes that will stop it immediately, but um, it does throw off some of the other systems, and so you have to be careful and judicious when you use that. Wow. That's wonderful. Thank you. I don't know if we have any other questions from we the audience a, or for some show, social media. We have a media. couple of other questions on okay, social great. media, if that's okay. 
Our next question is actually for our whole panel. And it is, were you involved in any clubs or did you attend any events that sparked your interest in working for NASA? To the panel. I can take that question. So um, I actually founded the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And through that organization, we, were, we had the opportunity, our, our school sponsored us to go to multiple conferences. So I, I ended up going to three uh, conferences. Conferences were amazing. I'm, I'm talking 500 different companies. And they were, they were uh, pretty much interviewing. They, they, you would meet them here, and then they would interview you on the spot. But from there, I was able to see what the industry was uh, had. And, and uh, basically, it inspired me to want to do something like I wanted to make sure that I, I got into uh, somewhere where they were going to do state-of-the-art systems and that's what ended up leading me here to NASA. And something great about being a college student is the Office of STEM Engagement and NASA just has a ton of programs. I think I participated in over three to four different programs just for college students while I was in university. Everything from XHAB, so building inflatable habitats, to building EVA tools and designing interfaces. There's tons of opportunities to get inspired in NASA. One of my exposures was actually through the IEC conference. As a graduate student, I traveled to a lot of conferences, and definitely the IEC was one of the highlights because um, I got to get introduced to all the NASA centers and, and industry and see how they work together. So definitely attending those conferences and making the contacts while you're there was a great way to, um, to pick for myself where I wanted to go. I think also just being involved in like some of the other clubs, not necessarily like NASA-run clubs, but some of the other clubs like the... American Society of Mechanical Engineers or AIAA because a lot of times NASA will go and they'll sponsor projects or have competitions that you can then participate in and kind of grow your information and grow your knowledge and network that way. Very good. Thank you, panels. Are there other questions we might have? Sure, we have other questions. Again, this is for the entire panel. Why do we need more young people pursuing STEM careers? What value can that bring to the space industry? I think um, what we're facing in this in, in aerospace right now is challenges like we've never seen before, right? It's difficult problems that we have to solve. And in order to solve those, we have to have fresh ideas. We have to think outside the box. So we need everyone. We need the whole team to participate in that. And that includes young people who come with new ideas, with a, a, new, uh, a new knowledge of how technology works. And the way that we use technology now is not the same as maybe our parents. Um, so I believe that we're especially important as part of the Artemis program and the aerospace program as a whole. We're sort of the future. Um, and we can bring those ideas to make to solve those hard problems. I would say uh, new ways of solving the same problem. So um, I, for example, there was a, a gentleman that was working on a, a rigid body dynamics, and he solved it all by hand. And I'm talking 16 pages of de derivation. Well, I, I wrote a MATLAB script to be able to do it all just, and, and every single time I just click go, it just, it does the derivation. So taking a, a new perspective of, of solving the, the same problem, like I said, mentioned before, making, so, solving these problems a little bit more efficiently. Um, like you were saying before, why it's important to have young people is we haven't been to the moon in about 50 years. So this is an, it's a new thing for most people working at NASA, and it's a massive challenge. And like we said, it's the Artemis program, and we are the Artemis generation. So it's our responsibility as young students or our calling to contribute to it. Um, and I think it's important, too, is that we take the lessons that the peop the more veteran people have learned and you know talk to the older people in our groups and learn the lessons that they learned so that we don't have to make the same mistakes and then also go um because we are we're learning new things you know the industry is evolving and we're learning new things while we're in school that maybe they didn't learn or they didn't know when they were in school um, so we can then go and you know merge those ideas and take the new topics that we're learning in school with some of the old ideas that they had and we can m adapt it and actually make it fit this new problem that Nobody has solved the Artemis problem yet because it's new and it's our program, it's our generation that we get to go and work on. It's very, very exciting. There's a place for everyone here at NASA. We're so excited about this Artemis program. We're gonna take some, uh, some questions from the audience as well. I think there's a microphone here on the side. If you're, you're uh, welcome to uh, line up at the mic if you have questions in the audience. It's very exciting to listen to our panelists. When I was a little boy, we first put people on the moon. And I remember my fourth grade teacher, we went into class uh, uh, that next year, and she said, anybody see the people walking on the moon? I was in a very small school in upstate New York. And I raised my hand. She said, one day you could do that too. And we thought she was crazy um, at that time, because I, 
because the, um, you know, at that time, you know, it, was, it seemed like superhuman feats that we were going to the moon. And so what I didn't realize until years later, it's just ordinary people from ordinary places with extraordinary dreams. And that's what we nurture here at NASA. We're very excited about our Artemis program. And we'll take our first question here. Hi, this is a question for all of the panelists. So I think there are a lot of people, both in the student community and just around the country, who think of NASA as being a very old-fashioned, you know, you know, older workforce kind of place. So you guys talked about how when you first joined NASA as young professionals, how you were kind of welcomed into the program and how you kind of found your way into being part of the NASA family. So as a, as a current intern, I might be well suited to answer this question, but we have a really rich program at NASA, not only mentorship, as we talked about before, but just within the, the intern community. Um, we have several employee resource groups just for, for new hires, for younger people in the group. But really, when you come on, there's there's so much work to do that you, you get in training immediately. So you're immediately in the mix of things, being put to work. You have a lot of the same responsibilities as some people who've been there for a couple of years because they expect you to learn, and you're welcome into the NASA family pretty easily. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more question right here. Yeah, hi, thank you. So I have a question from a friend and she's asking, as a chemical engineer, what fields are there for the profession? She's interested in ISRUs and jet propulsion, but doesn't want to restrict her in those fields. So I was hoping I could get your opinion on that. All right. Uh, well, as a chemical engineer, I'd say it, it depends where you want to work. For example, I work in flight operations, and we have people of every major. We have people who are pharmaceutical majors, chemist, chemistry, physics. Um, a lot of places you go, what we do at NASA is not done anywhere else. So you really start from the ground up. They teach you everything you need to know. Sometimes you're in the knowledge capture, or they'll train you for several years. A lot of our specialists who you see sit on console and mission control have trained for three years to be able to do that. And they come from all kinds of different backgrounds. So whatever major, whatever major you are, the most important thing is that you have a passion for the aerospace industry and you have a passion for space exploration and we'll teach you everything you need to know. Very exciting. I appreciate you young professionals coming and joining us on this panel. They'll be here for the remainder of the evening, I think. So afterwards, uh, please mingle and ask them uh, some additional questions and we invite you to join us here at NASA as well. It's a great place to work. And uh, coming up, we have uh, Jody Singer that's going to be joining us. Uh, she is uh, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center Center Director down in Huntsville, and so she's going to be joining us. But first, uh, let's hear from some young professionals at our other NASA centers around the world. Guys, Linda Dow here as Project Officer in Operational Space Medicine of the Canadian Space Agency located in Saint-Hubert, Quebec. Hi, my name is Chloe Audas. I work at the European Space Agency in the Netherlands as a Research Planning Engineer for the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Hiroka Inoue. I work for JAXA in Japan. Hi, my name is Dong Lee and I'm an engineer for CARI in Beijing, South Korea. Hey, my name is Charza Timmen and I'm a human robotics um, engineer at the European Space Agency. I support the planning and the execution of science experiments on board the station. We are conducting uh, microgravity experiments in a wide range of science disciplines to help us prepare for future missions to the Moon and Mars. For example, we're trying to understand how the human body is impacted by long duration space flights and we're also testing new technologies that will uh, enable deep space exploration. Here is JAXA's Runa Yad. I analyze running site for lunar polar exploration mission using real observation data. I aim to find safe and interesting targets in lunar polar region. I'm basically working on learning more about the interaction between man and machine, or humans and robots, um, to prepare them actually for future missions going to the moon, which is pretty cool. So I got inspired by the movie Apollo 13. Um, I thought it was just mind-blowing how something like that um, can actually, uh, you know, a moon mission can be realized. And uh, I thought, I want to grow up, become an aerospace engineer and get myself into a space agency. And that's what I ended up doing. I have degrees in biochemistry and interdisciplinary space studies, so I encourage you to apply your strengths and skill sets for future space exploration. 
I am part of the Artemis generation. The Artemis generation. The Artemis generation. And I'm excited for the future of space exploration. And we are going. And we are going. Join us. Well, hi, welcome back. I'm Jody Singer. I'm the center director at Marshall Space Flight Center. And I know, just like many of you in the studio audience and, and across that are listening, this is a fun activity, listening to the folks tell their story and share their experiences. And this is an opportunity that is just fun for everyone. I also want to make sure for our guests that are in the audience and, and listening, I know we have several college campuses that are listening to us today. I'm going to take the opportunity to say to my alma mater, roll tide. So with that, Doug, thanks for kicking us off. This has been a wonderful activity so far, and we're going to just keep it. The best is yet still to come. So with us, I have a NASA astronaut and uh, the current Deputy Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, Ken Bowersox. And I also have the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration, Steve Clark. So guys, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Thank Jody. You, Jody. All right, I'm going to have some questions for you guys, too, and then we're going to have participation by the studio audience and, and everybody else. So let's start off. Just tell me a little bit about the work you do with Artemis and how students factor into that equation. Ken, why don't you start first? Well, I'm the Deputy Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. A lot of the planning um, for Artemis uh, happens in our directorate. Um, but more than just the planning, a lot of the engineering, uh, a lot of the release of contracts, um, just a, a ton of the activity, figuring out how to budget for the program happens in the mission directorate. And uh, new hires, um, I mean, they're critical to making things work. Um, now, you know, they're out there, um, you know, driving crawlers and, uh, and helping to plan for our missions. But more than that, they're our future. They're the ones that 25 years from now are going to be taking my place uh, and carrying us on to the next uh, destination, whatever that turns out to be. And the best is just to come then too, right? That's a lot right. of fun. And never a stressful day, right? Always great. Never. It's always fun. <laughs> All right, Steve, tell us about your thoughts. Okay, well, quick shout out, like you said, to the schools at the watch parties uh, in the lower 48 and all the way up to Alaska, uh, near and dear to my heart up there in Fairbanks and Puerto Rico, I believe, as well. So, um, Absolutely. And beyond, go Knights. Um, so I'm in the science mission directorate, and um, I work for Artemis in a way with the robotic missions. Um, we're working right now to bring on commercial lunar landers to the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, um, where we're actually buying a ride to take science instruments and technology development payloads to the surface of the moon. We've got our first two deliveries coming up in July of 2021, right around the corner. So we're pretty excited about that. And I also work closely with Ken and the, my colleagues in the Human Space Flight uh, Directorate and also our Space Technology Mission Directorate. We're all working very closely together to take science with humans uh, and return to the moon. And so it's pretty exciting times. Um, we have a lot of interns that come in and work in the science mission directorate. And what's been great about that is they just bring fresh ideas, new innovative ways to look at things. You've heard a little bit about that on the young professional panel before us. Um, ideas that some of us uh, seniors, as we're called, I guess, um, uh, maybe aren't thinking Think about, yourself. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, it's been really refreshing to have uh, young folks come in and give us a whole different perspective on how to look at things. And so um, we encourage uh, internships, fellowships, um, and these challenges that we have, uh, because really we need those bold, new, innovative ideas as we return to the moon and look beyond to go uh, first human mission to Mars as well. So as you, as you kind of brought up, you know, we are a little bit more mature than, than the previous audience. Uh, there's a lot of experiences gained and lessons learned that we've had. So if you could tell our audience what you'd tell you, what you would have told yourself as a young college student going forward, what would you tell yourself? Steve, you go first. Okay. Well, I got to tell you, I've had the opportunity to work with Jody uh, for several years now. And so we've worked on many important programs that NASA has had, um, shuttle program. 
um, the Constellation program, and now we're working here closely together again with Artemis, so it's been fantastic. Um, I say that because working with some of the fantastic people I have been able to work with in the past and I work with now, um, I never would have dreamed I would have been able to do that. So looking back at myself, sitting where I'm at now, you know, work, working to return to the moon, it's something that I always wanted to do. Now, you mentioned more mature. Um, I'm probably one of those more mature ones. I remember Apollo 11. I remember watching it on a black and white TV. Uh, I was 10 years old, and I said, that's what I want to do. I always wanted to get involved with the space program. Um, and now I'm living the dream, actually, and returning to the moon with humans and robotics in a way that we've never really dreamed of before. Yeah. So to tell myself now that I'd be sitting here doing this, um, I would have said, no, nah, I don't believe you. <laughs> so can you, as an astronaut, what would you tell yourself? Um, would you I, do it I'd, I'd tell myself a lot of things. <laughs> First thing I'd tell myself is it's okay to dream. You know, have a dream. Um, the second thing would be, if you have a dream, try for it, which means put in applications for things. Um, the third thing is don't be in a hurry. Um, life goes by fast, and uh, you want to enjoy it while you're there. And the fourth thing is have a backup plan. Absolutely. So, you know, we've talked about that across America, across everywhere, you can be a part, you know, you can be a part of what we do. And so to contribute to the Artemis program, there's Artemis student challenges that are helping us solve problems and helping us solve things that we don't even know that we could accomplish and doing the impossible. So we've got a video to share with you. So let's join in and watch. NASA's Artemis student challenges, driving innovation that will take us forward to the moon providing students across America with unique opportunities to conduct research design that directly contributes to NASA's Artemis mission, encouraging new thinking and new ideas in space exploration technology. With NASA Student Launch, teams of students build and fly rocket propulsion systems of their own design, requiring students to put theory into practice to take their rockets to new heights giving them exposure into the foundations of rocket design that NASA is applying on a much larger scale in the Space Launch System. In Micro-G Next, NASA engineers identify new technology needed for space exploration, and students work to create it. Their creations are put to the test in simulated microgravity, where they are evaluated against unforgiving requirements if they are to be used in future missions. Creating autonomous robots that can operate millions of miles from Earth and support human missions to the moon. That's the challenge of the Lunabotics competition. Teams build robots that can navigate the simulated terrain of another world and complete their assigned task. So to be able to come down to Kennedy and meet people from Michigan, from Alaska, from Puerto Rico, um, it's a great opportunity just to kind of network with other engineers and really get into the spirit of the competition. So. The NASA Human Exploration Rover Challenge has teams combine their design, engineering, and building skills to construct human power technology that must perform in a variety of environments, challenging the design and the designers. The NASA Suits Challenge has students design and build spacesuit information displays, all within augmented reality environments. The thought came about, why don't we involve students in these designs? We can do that and involve them as part of a challenge and create something for the spacesuit in the future. Their inspiration allowing them to influence spacesuit technology and potentially future Artemis missions. Take the challenge and explore with us as we look to you to build and design the next wave of space technologies to take us to the moon and beyond. That's the mission of the Artemis generation. Every mission starts somewhere. Why not here? Artemis Student Challenges. So the Artemis program, you can be a part of it, taking us to the moon and beyond. So don't hesitate, don't be scared. Step out there and take a challenge. We want you to join us. So remember, you can find information about this on ways to join us by looking at nasa.gov slash join Artemis. 
So I know that there are a lot of questions out there uh, with our listeners as well as in the studio audience. So I'd like to be able to go to the audience and, and see what we've got going. So for those of you that are interested in asking questions, if you'd please go ahead and line up at the mic, we'd appreciate that. But first, I'm going to go to Milliford. Please, get us started. Yeah, Jody, we have a question actually for the whole panel. What is your favorite thing about working for NASA and on the Artemis missions? And what is the biggest challenge you face? Any, many, money. Wow, so th there's so much to be, I, I mentioned before, to be excited about where we're at today. I mean, this, this is just a whole different environment that personally I think that we've been in before where we're leveraging the, uh, the strengths of our commercial partners and our international partners. I mean, everybody is in on Artemis. Um, we've been talking with our international colleagues here at the IAC all week, and I can the level of excitement and energy is where I've never seen it before. And so when I say everybody's in globally, everybody is in and working with us, wanting to talk with us, how can they contribute? Um, that's what's exciting about this. Um, some of the challenges, and, and these are good challenges to have actually, I think, is how do we stitch all of this together, right, with partnerships? Um, how do we work with our commercial partners in, in a new and a different way? I mentioned the commercial lunar payload services. Um, this is a whole new approach that we're trying where we're buying a ride to the surface of another body off the earth, right? We're going to the moon. How do we work with our commercial partners and how do they work with us? And it's, it's really been a, an exciting learning experience and, and I encourage you if you talk with some of the companies out there, I'd love to hear their feedback. But I think they're finding that NASA is serious about this, the, the partnerships that we want to, to utilize uh, to go uh, to the moon and even beyond. And it's in a, a completely different environment. That's what's really exciting about this. We're going to keep coming up against challenges, but if we combine our strengths working together with, with industry, academia, our international partners, I personally don't think there's anything we can't solve. Okay. Ken? Well, uh, for me, I've been interested in space exploration since I was little. Right, And what's most positive uh, that I see today is how much support and interest we're getting from a broad cross-section of people, right? And so um, that makes me happy to come to work every day. Um, the biggest challenge is staying calm in the middle of all that excitement. You know, when you have all that excitement, it can go in lots of different directions. And that's where we've been the last 50 years. You know, we've tried. We haven't uh, made it where we wanted to go. We've tried again. We haven't made it where we wanted to go. Um, but, you know, still down there at a lower level, we've been working and working step by step by step. Right, and that's the kind of focus we need. And for me, that's the biggest challenge: is, is maintaining that focus so we can maintain the progress and get to the moon. Absolutely, so. and beyond. So that's why we need all of you in the audience and online. We need you to be part of it, to keep the momentum going, and, and keep us keep us going. So I think now that's going to be a great opportunity. You've been patiently standing at the mic, so I'm going to turn it over to you to ask your question. Thank you. Uh, so what do you think the greatest overall challenge is going to be for the Artemis program uh, moving forward? Who would you like to answer, ask it? Well, Either one. I, I'll start. <laughs> Steve can fill in later. You know, um, I think, again, the, the biggest challenge is maintaining the focus so that we can keep support across a broad enough section of our population here in the U.S. and in all our international partners um, so that we can get the funding required, get the resources we need um, so that we can move ahead. I think we can handle a lot of the technical challenges. There are technical challenges, but I think the, the real challenges are more political and group dynamics. And um, again, that's uh, the, the hardest part, I think. So I guess I would, and I agree with the technical challenges, I think we can work to overcome those. I think the greatest challenge is, is really to, to figure out how can we do things more efficiently um, than we've done before. Um, a lot of us have worked through uh, many years on different programs and different processes, and how can we change things? How can we kind of change the paradigm of, I talked about it just a little while ago, about uh, the government role in these partnerships with industry, academia, our international colleagues. Um, we, we really need to kind of pool the ideas together to figure out how to better streamline and become more efficient to achieve these goals. 
And, and I think we're doing that. I think we have pressed against some of the older traditions or older requirements that we've always been kind of locked into, and we've challenged them. And um, not only from a leadership standpoint, from again, going back with our young professionals, they've asked those same questions. Well, why do you do it that way? Well, we've always done it that way. Well, why? I think we have a better way of doing it this way. So we continue to find ways to push back on some of those old processes and make it a little more efficient. And I think we'll be able to achieve our objectives uh, in a more streamlined fashion if we keep pressing against some of those um, hard right. processes that we've all kind of stumbled over over the years. And I can say in my career, there's been a lot of times that when I ask the question, many of the times other people in the audience or, or in the meeting had the same question. They just didn't have uh, the courage to ask that question because many of the times we do things, we get in a routine. And that's what y'all bring, just like the young panelists brought up before. Because you understand, you're asking questions. You ask things that don't make sense. You question us, you make us help describe it, and as a result of it, we all have a better understanding, and many of the times we come up with even better ways to do things, and that is what's so fantastic. That's what pays it for. So I think we have time for one more question. So in the audience, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so we all know that the Autonomous Program is us. It's also K through 12. Um, what can we do as college students and young professionals to reach out to especially underrepresented uh, groups in the industry so we can inspire the next generation after us because that's important to keep the momentum going and to get us to Mars. Well, I'd say one of the things that you can do is always remember we talked about mentorship. You're never too old or too young to mentor. There is always someone that you can teach. And I'll tell you, when I mentor, I'll learn as much from someone that I mentor than, than they probably get from me. So I'll tell you that is paying it forward. And because you in the audience and younger students, y'all have the ability to be able to understand what folks are asking, what is relevant, what is really what they're asking. And so you have a part of showing the different steps. Everybody has their own recipe. Everybody has their own way of doing things. So it's helping them help figure it out. And the key way of doing it is don't be afraid to ask the questions. So anything you guys would like to add? Well, um, we are only going to be able to make Artemis successful if we are a really high performing team. And when I say team, I don't mean just Jody and Steve and me and the administrator. Um, I don't mean just the folks in this room. I don't need, mean the folks just at NASA. I mean the, all the people in the United States who have to support the program, all the people in our international partners who need to support the program. It's a really, really large group that we need to get working together and moving in the same direction. And one of the ways you can help is to tell them which way we want to go, let them know what we want to do, and be an advocate for the program. Um, share why it's important to you. Having a diverse and inclusive workforce that brings out the best. Everybody is important. Everybody's important. Steve, there's anything you'd like yeah, to Yeah, I would add volunteer. Reach out as a volunteer to talk to K through 12. Um, in this day of social media, there are so many avenues where you can reach so many people now, um, millions and millions of people um, with blogs, with chats, um, I encourage you to use all avenues to really get the word out about Artemis and, and the contributions that people can make um, to the Artemis program, to work with NASA, to work with our commercial partners. Um, I, you are the best voice out there that can help just by talking with people. Um, you know, I, I have this happen a lot to me, and I'm sure Ken and Jody do too. Just about every time I'm flying on an airplane on a business trip, I'll open up my laptop and I'll start working, and then I'll see a NASA sticker or something NASA on my screen, and they'll, oh, do you work for NASA? And just, I'll have a conversation, sometimes even for a couple hours going across country. You can reach out just to one person, even younger people than you, and inspire them. Um, uh, I, I remember our uh, former associate administrator, Robert Lightfoot, told me about a story, and I think he probably shared it with you all, too. He was coming back from a flight from Australia, very long flight, Australia to here. And he ended up talking to one student for the entire trip because he was so inspired when he found out who he was sitting next to that they had a great exchange. And it made a difference in this person's life. I know they still stay in touch now. So I highly encourage you to reach out in all avenues, younger than you, your peers, even older. Thank you so much. 
So I know the conversation will continue, and I'm looking forward to my boss coming up on stage, uh, Jim Bridenstine, the administrator. Also, we'll have Sandy Magnus, a former astronaut and co-chair of this year's IEC Local Organizing Committee. And then we also have two astronauts that'll be joining us on stage, Jeanette Epps and Doug Wheelock, Oh wheels So from there, before we go to that though, and before they join us on stage, I'd like to be able to, to turn this over again to our correspondents to make sure that we talk about what we have on the IAC. So let's go to the video. Welcome to the 2019 International Astronautical Congress. My name is Nilfa Ramji, and you're here with me at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center in Washington, DC. This year's theme, the power of the past, the promise of the future. The International Astronautical Congress, or IAC, is the one place where the world comes together to acknowledge and discuss new developments in space. Space exploration gives us a better understanding of how we can engage with the solar system and how it can better benefit us here on Earth. Clean water, renewable electricity, access to the internet, this is the most exciting time in human history and space exploration is a huge part of it. This week, scientists and engineers have presented their work to further progress space policy, research and discuss new developments. I'm at IAC to give a presentation about the MicroGene X activity, which we feel aptly prepares undergraduate students for the STEM workforce. This activity is for anyone. You can be any uh, major. You don't necessarily have to be an engineering major to contribute to NASA's missions, um, and we would love to see you soon. My name is Lindsay Aitchison, and I'm at NASA headquarters, where I'm the EVA strategy lead for the Artemis program. That means that I'm in charge of everything the astronauts need to do from the time they touch the surface till they come back up. I'm here at IUC to help educate the public about what it is that we're doing for our Artemis program, about the new spacesuits that we're building, and how we're really going to achieve this mission quickly and sustainably. I'm here at IAC to talk to the public about what we at NASA are doing to prepare for the Artemis missions. We really want to get the public excited and engaged about the science that we're going to be doing on the lunar surface, and my role is to talk about that science and the development of technologies to advance science on the lunar surface. We have a lot of exciting lunar science questions that we need answered, and having astronauts on the lunar surface is the best way to do that. My work is helping to prepare these astronauts to train them in geology and to develop the tools and equipment we will need to prep for science on the lunar surface. I would say this is a great time to be involved in the space industry. Not only do we have missions that are exciting, we're all working together to achieve those missions. So they're really jobs for everyone. It's not just an engineer or just a scientist. There are opportunities throughout the entire space industry to get involved so we can all feel a part of it. And that's what I think is super great about what we're doing today. IEC is such an exciting week. It brings together spaceflight professionals from all across the world. It's a great chance for NASA to work with both commercial and international partners. And a lot of that collaboration can happen throughout the rest of the year, but IEC is the best place for all of that to happen at one place at one time. It's a really exciting week. To succeed, we must come together. This is the spirit of collaboration. This is the spirit of IAC. Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's happened here at IAC. Back to you, Jody. So thank, thank you, Nilifer. You did a great job. So now, welcome back. So now we have a very distinguished panel up here with us joining it. So first off, I'd just like to start by saying, Administrator Bronstein, let's start with you. And tell me a little bit about how a conference like this helps share and shape our Artemis vision. A uh, great question. So um, at the IAC, uh, we just hosted a multilateral conference, and we had all of our international partners that currently exist on the International Space Station, but we also had other partners there. We had, at the table, a total of 26 nations wow. that are thirsty to join us as we return to the moon. And this time when we go to the moon, we go with a very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps, uh, and we go under the name of the twin sister of Apollo her name, of course, is Artemis. And I will tell you, that has been, what, what has been, I think, most impressive to me is how thirsty all of the world is to join us in this effort. It's very exciting. Um, we've never had 26 partners 
um, on any of our missions before. It might be a little more complicated than we know how to deal with at this point, but it really is an exciting opportunity to inspire the world. Uh, and I'm very proud to lead the agency that ultimately is, is, is kind of leading this whole effort. So it's, uh, it's a great day. And this IAC, that's what it's all about. It's about bringing our international partners together and trying to figure out who can do what in order to achieve the objective. Thank you. Janet, got a response? Would you like to talk well, about Well, this conference has, um, it kind of reinvigorates the um, same spirit that we had with Apollo, um, the original Apollo program. So seeing all of the international partners here and talking with a lot of students, and especially with the young people that um, you saw earlier, it kind of reinvigorates this whole idea of we as a world should go back to the moon and do the work that we started, do the science that we started, but not just do the science, but also stay there on, on the moon and use everything that we do there and develop new technologies to get us to Mars. So um, this conference has been um, a wonderful um, event for me so far. Okay. Doug, I'm going to ask you a, another question. So tell me a little bit about what you think the importance of STEM is and, and how that ties into NASA's overall objectives. Sure. It actually ties into one of the most exciting things for me here at this Congress is that um, now we see a resurgence like in our commercial base. So you see companies big and small that now can play a part in our Artemis mission. and. Um, and that starts with the wee little ones. Just yesterday, I spent some time with some uh, with some uh, elementary school age kids, and they're also very excited because now they understand there's a place for them too in this Artemis generation. And uh, we we like to think that in, in a few uh, couple of decades we'll be setting foot on the surface of Mars as well. And so, and our astronauts are usually selected when they're in their young to mid 30s. That means those first Martian walkers are somewhere in our school system. That's very exciting uh, to us here at NASA as well. So it STEM is where it all starts for us, and we try to we try to uh, let the our even our littlest of uh, of students, our youngest of students, our little kids, to let them know that there's a place for them as well. It just takes ordinary people with extraordinary dreams, and that's very important to us here at NASA. So Sandy, I'm going to ask you the same question. Talk about STEM and how it ties into NASA's overall objective and what you tell this audience. Well, first of all, that's our future workforce. So Absolutely. I mean, that's the direct tie-in, right? But it's interesting. When I, when I was a young girl dreaming of being an astronaut, I grew up in a small town in southern Illinois, and I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I focused on physics because I didn't know what engineering was. I didn't discover engineering until I was in college, and, and that really opened up my eyes to the fact that when you're young, you can't dream something you've never heard about or you don't know about. And so it really behooves us as an organization, not just NASA, but across the whole aerospace industry, and, and you guys can be a big part of this, is getting into the school systems across the country and showing students what their possibilities are, showing students what are the, all the exciting things are that are going on in aerospace so these kids as well can, it, can aspire and have these dreams because, again, it's hard to dream about something that you don't know about. And so NASA reaching into the school systems, you reaching back into your school systems, others across the aerospace industry reaching back into the school systems and showing students what they can do, what is going on, and opening their minds and, and widening their horizons. It's very, very important for, for the sustainment of our space industry and some of the goals that NASA wants to achieve in the future. Okay, so I know we have a studio audience here and also some social media. So Nilifer, I'm gonna turn it over to you. So let's have one question from the sure. social media. And Judy, then we'll go we to our audience. We have a question for you actually. What makes SLS so powerful that NASA thinks it is the only rocket that can make the Artemis mission successful? Well, <laughs> well I would tell you. Uh, I think, you know, from a space launch system, it is the enabling factor that helps us be able to get deeper into space than we've ever gone before and to take the humans and their systems required to go into deep space. When you think about what it takes to cheat gravity and you think about the workforce that we have, so I think it's the workforce. I think it's we're counting on you. We're counting on what it takes to be able to lift humans than they've ever gone before and to do it with more power and thrust than we've ever had in this whole program. So I think it is a wonderful opportunity to be and do something different that we've never done before. All right, I think now, unless there's anyone else that'd like I'll, to answer that, that one. All right. 
I, first of all, SLS and Orion, uh, that's the backbone of how we're going to get to the moon. Absolutely. Remember what Artemis is. We're going to the moon within five years. That's the direction we've been given. Why do we go fast? Uh, we heard Ken Bowersox earlier talk about the biggest challenges. He said political risk. That's the right answer. That's why we're not on the moon right now. How do we retire political risk? We go fast. We get it done, and then we make it sustainable. How do you make it sustainable? You drive down costs, you increase access, you inspire the generations so that ultimately our representatives know that it's a, it's a requirement from the public that we do this exploration that is in our hearts. It's, it's what we desire. Um, but in order to go fast, remember, we're ret retiring political risk, we need to take advantage of capability that is almost there. We, we have the SLS rocket, we have the Orion crew capsule, they're on the five yard line, we're about to punch them into the end zone. Absolutely. And <laughs> by, the end of, by the end of this year, we're gonna be rolling the SLS out of the Michou assembly facility. It's gonna go to the launch, or not the launch pad, but the test facility. We're gonna do a green run test. It's gonna be, the, it's gonna be beautiful. I can't wait for it, just so you Me can either. tell. <laughs> um, I cannot wait for that day. And when that day comes, uh, here's the thing, on day one, the SLS rocket will be a fully qualified rocket for human spaceflight. There's not another opportunity to achieve that by, in the timeline that we're looking at. So remember, we've got, we've got to do an uncrewed Artemis 1. We've got to do a crewed Artemis 2 around the moon. And then we've got to do a crewed Artemis 3 to the surface of the moon. And the SLS rocket and the Orion crew capsule are the ways that we get our humans there. But don't get me wrong. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for a lot of other rockets, and we need them all. We need commercial partners to help us get cargo. We got to get a human landing system delivered um, to the gateway to go down to the surface of the moon. There's lots of opportunities, uh, but the SLS and the Orion are the backbone that are going to get our humans there. Absolutely. What he said. Now you know why he's the boss. Absolutely. So now let's go to our studio audience for a question. I have a two-part question. So is there anything in the pipeline for after Artemis? And if so, are there any alternative propulsion systems being developed right now? And uh, I just wanted to add, go Tigers. <laughs> and those are fighting words with her, my goodness. Um, so I went to Rice University in Houston, Texas. We haven't won a football game yet this year. Um, so I, no, nobody, nobody can be mad at me. Um, uh, but, but I'll tell you this, um, when I was at Rice back in 1994, we beat Texas. So how about that? Um, so yes, after... <laughs> After um, Artemis, uh, guess what? We're, we're going to the moon for a purpose, and this is sometimes missed. We're going to the moon for really one reason. We're trying to learn how to live and work on another world using the resources of that other world so that we can go to Mars. The question is, why are we going to Mars? Well, just this year, we have found that there's liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. What does that mean? Well, we don't know, but here's what we know about liquid water on Earth. Wherever it exists, there's life. Is that true on Mars? We don't know, but we ought to go find out. So that's number one. We now know that there's complex organic compounds on the surface of Mars. The building blocks for life are in fact on Mars. And we know that methane, one of those complex organic compounds, the methane cycles of Mars are commensurate with the seasons. In other words, the probability of finding life on another world keeps going up. We go to the moon for a purpose. Because we want to get to Mars, we need to learn how to live and work on another world. The moon is the proving ground. Mars is the destination. So yes, we love Artemis. We're going to go sustainably to the moon. We're going to stay at the moon. But we're building the capabilities as much as possible that we can replicate at Mars. So yes, absolutely, <laughs> there's a lot to come after Artemis. And uh, I know I just took everybody's time. That's very, very well said, sir. Very well said. And it kind of goes back to one of my favorite sayings, you know, if you want to go far, you know, you, you want to go fast, you can go alone. But when you want to go far, you want to go together. That's right. So you that's the key together. of it, you know, where we want to go. All right, let's go to the next question. We have time for one more question. Hi, hello. First, a shout out to my university where we have students watching the live stream right now. Go see wolves. <laughs> So my question is, how does the emergence of private space companies such as SpaceX Blue and Blue Origin affect NASA's strategy for the Artemis mission? I guess that's geared towards me. All right. So we, we need private companies. Here's the thing. Here's what NASA does. Um, historically, if we're going to go forward and do um, 
monumental things. The traditional way of doing contracting is NASA puts out an RFI. It takes us about six months to put out a, a request for information. And then six months later, uh, industry responds to that request for information. Then NASA puts out a request for proposals. By the way, the first request for proposal will be panned by industry, so we'll have to rewrite it. And then industry, after six months later, they will respond to our request for proposal. And then six months after getting all of those responses, we'll actually select a contractor. After that, all the other contractors that didn't get selected will protest. And once that protest happens, it'll get locked up in the courts for another year. Three years after we decided to do something, we will actually start. Um, <laughs> And in the meantime, the, poli the political winds change, the political risk catches up to us, and the whole thing gets shut down. That's why we're not on the moon right now. Here's what a lot of the new companies bring. They bring a different way of doing business, and I want to be clear, um, it's NASA that ultimately enables that new way of doing business. We are doing contracting in a way that hasn't been done before. We want to buy services. We don't want to purchase, own, and operate rockets and hardware and space stations the way we used to. In so many ways, there's this robust commercial marketplace where we can buy services and we want to buy services wherever we can. And where there are markets where we can be one customer of many customers and we can have numerous providers that are competing on cost and innovation to drive down cost and increase access, that's where we want to be as an agency. So yes, we need to do these new ways of contract where instead of owning hardware, we're, we're buying services, and then we expect our contractors to go get customers that are not NASA, driving down costs, increasing access, and increasing opportunity for more people to do more things in space. That's the objective. Commercial companies are a big piece of that. But I also want to say this. Some of our more traditional contractors are behaving a lot more like commercial companies. And a lot of our older, <laughs> some of our newer commercial companies are starting to operate more like the traditional contractors. What we're seeing is that this idea of, of new space and old space, it is blending, it is merging in a way. And the difference is this, the way NASA goes about contracting for the capability is what matters. What matters less is what the company is, if that makes sense. Happy. I'm sorry, yeah, so. I love your passion. Okay. <laughs> Go! <laughs> It's a good question. Go see wolves. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I, I know that uh, we have probably one more topic that is a special thing that we'd like to debut through the world. So what I'd like to do is um, have a, an opportunity to turn this over to Administrator Bronstein. So I turn it over to you to do your special message and your special surprise. Okay, as you look around, you look around the room, you see this um, Artemis logo around. Um, now that Artemis logo looks, quite frankly, like a kind of modern version of the traditional Apollo logo. Do we have a, a picture of the Apollo logo? Oh, it's right there, it's in front of me. Um, okay, so I think it's on the screens up on here. Screens up okay, there. so you can see the Apollo logo, the new Artemis logo, of course, came uh, from that inspiration. Uh, and if you look at the logo, you can tell it's, it's, we're going from the Earth, in fact, to the moon. Oh, look, who's on the moon? It's Apollo. <laughs> Apollo is not the goddess of the moon. Apollo is something else. So we've decided that we need to create a new image, an image of the moon with the goddess of the moon, and her name is Artemis. So this is the new image um, that we're rolling out today. This is the image of Artemis on the moon. And of course, a lot of people can interpret this a lot of different ways. But I'll tell you, our people here at NASA do great work when it comes to art. Uh, I know you've seen a lot of NASA's art a, a lot of different places. But you could see Artemis here. Maybe it looks like um, she is in a, uh, it, it could be a, a space helmet. Um, it looks like her hair uh, is coming around the corner there. Uh, that, that actually could be a, a rocket trajectory. Um, and of course, um, it looks like that rocket trajectory could be heading off to the moon itself. So there's a lot of different ways to interpret this. I just think it's magnificent. Um, we are now going to the moon, and we're going to the moon in a way that's never been done before. We're going sustainably. In other words, we're gonna stay at the moon. We're going with international partners. We're going with commercial partners. We're going to utilize the resources of the moon. Um, and we're going to take the knowledge and the capability, the technology and the architecture, and we're going to apply as much of it as possible to Mars. Um, and this time when we go to the moon, 
Unlike the 1960s when all of our astronauts came from fighter pilot and test pilot backgrounds and there were no opportunities for women, this time when we go to the moon, we're going with all of America, very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women, um, and not just all of America. In fact, we're going with international partners. We're going with the world. We're leading the world in a coalition of nations to go to the moon sustainably and ultimately go to Mars. And I just think that this image created by so many great people here at NASA represents um, kind of the new generation, and it's your generation. This is our generation. I'm the first NASA administrator that wasn't alive. I, I heard Steve Clark talk about where he was. He was 10 years old when we landed on the moon on Apollo 11. I, I don't have that memory, Steve. I wasn't alive yet. Um, and looking around this room, I'm the first NASA administrator that does not have that memory. We cannot allow that to happen again. Your generation, my generation, I know I'm older than you, don't get me wrong, I understand that. <laughs> but this generation, we cannot allow another generation to go by where we're not living and working on another world. This generation, our generation, this is the Artemis generation, I want to be clear, we love Apollo. But this is our moment, this is our time, we have to make it happen. And I think now is the time to do it, I think we're having... We have strong bipartisan support on the Hill. We're retiring political risk as much as possible. We're going faster. We've now got 26 nations that are interested in join joining the coalition, and there is room for more. We can make this happen. We've got to make it happen, and we're looking for all of you to communicate with all of your peers and, and the groups that you influence because now is the time to do it. So with that, thank you. Absolutely. Call to action. All right. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. And for where we are, we're counting on you. And so please uh, make sure that you understand we have an opportunity for you to be able to join in and to find out what we have. We have ability to download apps and to be able to see the woman in the moon and to understand where we're going. So please, nasa.gov, join Artemis. Please download and make sure you share the vision. And thank you for being a part of our audience. And thank you to this wonderful team for being here. Hopefully you feel our passion, our inspiration, and you know where we're going. Thank you. We are going to the moon. This time, to stay. And we are the Artemis generation. Join us in paving the way. As Artemis, we will land the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. And what we learn there will propel us on to Mars. Join us in innovation. The technologies, the studies, and the endurances we develop for the moon will make future human missions to Mars possible. Join us in exploring. We are ready. The desire to discover and inhabit distant worlds is in our DNA. NASA will take the next giant leap in human exploration and inspire the world. The Artemis generation is diverse, talented, and capable. The Artemis generation is you. Join us. <laughs>